Welcome uh, to another FIU Zoom Hangout with Coach Davis, Butch and I. Um, finished starting off the weekend here. Coach, glad to be with you once more. Hey, how's how's the weekend, uh, the week been, I should say? Uh, you had a lot of meetings when we chatted uh, on Tuesday. What's What's been going on the rest of the week for you here? Yeah, you know what? I, I, to be honest with you, AJ, I'd say that probably 85% of it's very positive. It's, uh, you know, getting a chance to do a leadership meeting with 18 of our players on Sunday night. And then we got special teams meetings on Monday and Thursday and and uh, doing staff meetings and talking to the coaches. And today we had a probably a two hour and 15 minute uh, recruiting meeting where all 10 of the full time coaches kind of went through their top 10 or 15 not only positional players, but also the players that are in their geographic region within the state of Florida. Uh, we watched video. We talked about the players. Uh, and obviously the one thing that's missing from recruiting is being able to get these guys, uh, the prospects on campus. I mean, obviously during spring practice, you're flooded with trying to get a half a dozen or a dozen kids almost every single day and trying to have a junior day where you're trying to get 30, 40, or 50 guys in and, uh, you know, so we haven't been able to do that, but we are reaching out. We're writing letters, writing cards to guys, uh, calling them, texting them, doing all yeah. kinds of social media. So uh, it's it's been a pretty good week. Yeah, before before we get into this is a Twitter question Friday. Before we get into that, I, you know, that brings up a good point. How different is it? How how uh, what are the challenges or or what's unique about recruiting in this? this stage here in yeah. April and May, um, whether it be, you know, how you try to show off your campus, your pitch to guys, um, you know, how do you, how do you do that efficiently and effectively at this stage? Yeah. Well, the missing aspect is obviously, you, you know, normally you get six weeks of spring recruiting that at the end of uh, our spring practices, the coaches get a chance to go all over the entire state of Florida and they cold call, they go into high schools. They know where most of the players are, but they also know, that some of these schools, they don't have a player maybe for 2021, but they may have some really good sophomores, some really good freshmen. And so you're kind of building a, uh, a, you know, a prospect list for future down the line. But, you know, the coaches get a chance to go and watch these guys in spring practice and watch them compete, watch them play. How fast are they? How instinctive are they? And, uh, you know, so not being able to go and do that, basically, I mean, we're recruiting off a of sophomore and junior film. Uh, got our fingers crossed that hopefully at some point, uh, mm. you know, the target is maybe the end of June, maybe it's in July, uh, that we actually can start bringing, uh, you know, student athletes onto campus and let them have academic meetings, let them see, uh, you know, not only the facilities, but the campus, meet with the coaches, um, you know, and so we're, we got our fingers crossed that we don't lose that. Uh, yeah. It would be really, really difficult, to, you know, to go into September and start a recruiting process that signing day is going to be in the middle of December. And the only thing that you've ever done is be able to watch them play on video or, you know, or we'll have to start going out on Friday nights of home games uh, mm-hmm. and watching kids play just to see how they, you know, how they play because videos are really good, but they don't show the passion. They don't show, you know, what a lot of times the things that you're looking at is how does the kid on the sidelines, how does he interact with his teammates? Is he encouraging them? Uh, you know, is he trying to, you know, get the players to play harder? Is he talking to, is he taking a leadership role? So there's yeah. just so many things that's missing from the standpoint that's, you know, that's personal. And then uh, hopefully we'll get some of that back. The, um, yeah, the, the evaluations and I'm sure having the network that that you do in South Florida, you may help to call up a coach that give me, give me the 411 on this guy. Give me your evaluation. You know, that helps in, in the meantime, certainly. Oh, yeah. no doubt. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Of, I mean, South, and, yeah. you know, and our coaches do a good job of that because we already started building this class, you know, a year ago. So in the spring a year ago, we started, you know, getting the names of these kids uh, so that you would know who to kind of try to follow once the season was over with after bowl season and uh, get a chance. And we were prepared to go out. I mean, we thought yeah. that we'd be going out you know, in the middle of April and be out the last two weeks of April and the whole month of May and, and go to jamborees and, and all the scrimmages sevens, yeah. that you guys are doing. And I'll tell you, the, the high school coaches, if you t- when you're talking to them and you're talking to high school prospects, they're as frustrated as everybody else because they've been out of school, you know, for the six, seven, eight weeks. And, uh, you know, and, and the one thing I think that's probably a positive thing that happened this week is in the state of Florida and a lot of other states, they're starting to open up the gymnasium. So where yeah. kids can actually start now go and train. And they can run, they can lift. Uh, 
you know, and as things start to relax and then eventually a lot of these kids will start getting a chance to work out with their teammates and maybe have some Maryland uh, seven on seven and some one on one. So, you know, a lot of football programs on all levels from the NFL all the way down to high school everybody's looking forward to that yeah you know and without myself giving any commentaries on any of this just strictly from what i've read on the news you see you see miami dade county hoping to have summer camps and in the meantime yeah. parks have opened and uh you know I, again hopefully with all this everyone stays safe but it, ho- ho- a lot of encouraging signs a- as we move forward hey twitter Absolutely. twitter friday all right we got a good number of questions here uh, we're gonna start with Anna, who's been a, a big fan of these Zooms, thanks for, for joining in once again. She says, Coach, uh, due to obvious reasons, the year's spring showcase was canceled. Is there going to be another opportunity for a showcase or meet and greet event down the road? We attended last year's, had a great time meeting the players. Yeah. So what, once the you know restrictions are lifted a little bit, what, what do you think you envision? Yeah. That? Well, the one thing, AJ, and I appreciate you call, or calling in, you know, last year we did kind of a meet the Panthers night, and uh, and it was going to be, a, and we still had a great turnout. I mean, we had the band, we had cheerleaders, the Dazzlers, uh, a lot of the players' parents, and and it was scheduled to be on the field where where fans could come out, they could take pictures with uh, with the guys on the team in their jerseys and get autographs. We will probably do something like that again. Uh, in August, I just don't know the date of it right now. I mean, hopefully, once we know when we can go back and when we can start practicing, and then once most of the practice is over with, and as we're starting to scale back because of the game, you know, maybe 10 days before uh, the opening game of the season, you know, maybe we'll try to have something there, you know, in the stadium and uh, and publicize it and make try to get a lot of people there to get excited about the season. That was a lot of fun. I was, I was oh, under was the stands great. at Ricardo. So we had a great turnout for that. Really, it was a blast. It, it really was. And, and and the weather, you know, we had the terrible storm there early, but a lot of people stayed. We did it underneath the stadium, and yeah. you know, and we we anticipated. We thought that maybe we'd be lucky if we got a thousand or twelve hundred, and uh, we might have ended up getting two thousand to three thousand people show yeah. up, and and students being back on campus. I mean, that would be another great thing to add to that. Yeah, it's always always a lot of energy at those uh, as we get set to start the year. All right, this is from uh, Armin Aru on Facebook. Uh, it says, Coach, you've, you've coached our only two quarterbacks uh, to be drafted in school history, and Alex Magoo and James Morgan. Also, those two QBs being drafted the, more than any other program in the state of Florida the past five years. That's a side note. He also asks, what impact will this success have with future yeah. quarterback classes? And yeah. I think that's a great point. Yeah, no, it's a great point, and it is a good question. That obviously recruits are looking at the success of the players that you have in your program, and all the places that I've coached. You know, when you started having great players at certain particular positions, obviously we had a lot of great running backs at uh, the University of Miami with Clinton Portis, Najee Davenport, and and once we started getting really good running backs, and James Jackson, then that led. And Edron James, then that led to getting the Willis McGees and, really? and uh, mm-hmm. you know, Frank Gores and guys like that. And in almost every program that I've ever been, when you start having players that have success in college and they get a chance to get drafted or sign as a free agent, you, then kids know that they're going to go into a program that's going to prepare them for the next level. And uh, and having two quarterbacks, obviously we inherited Alex McGoo, and which was – which was a blessing because he he was a great athlete and he was a terrific uh, competitor. Uh, and I think his success, to be honest with you, the success that he had and getting drafted uh, in, in the seventh round, I think that that helped us get James Morgan. I think, right. he, you know, all the other previous quarterbacks that I had had at a lot of different places, but when he can see, you know, this is what, you know, what you're doing with Alex and the success he's having, I want to be a part of that. And then he comes in and has two great years. And then obviously he gets drafted in the fourth round. So, uh, you know, I think that both of those guys getting drafted are going to help us continue to get a high level of quarterbacks to come into the program. Uh, I remember Alex, he had his first off week during the season, uh, that, for that rookie year in Seattle. He, he takes the bye week. He flies down to Miami, and he doesn't even go home before he's at the practice fields to see, right. to see all the guys. He said, where'd you go for it? I literally just came straight from the airport. Like, he did. That's, 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 that's a, Panther pride right there. Oh, no kidding. It was great to have him back, and uh, James and Alex should do great things here sure. moving forward. All right, next question. Uh, Coach, we got a question that says, what happens to the players 
that aren't. I need to get his Twitter handle before it's done. What happens to the players that aren't drafted? Does the staff mm-hmm. start calling up teams and promoting their guys? Uh, there's conversations happen. What happens sure. when the guys when guys aren't drafted? And what's the typical protocol if they have the talent? You know they do. How does that process yeah. work? Well, obviously, one of the the two things that probably hurt not only our players but a lot of players across the country is 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 most most teams have what's called a pro day. And sometime during the middle of the spring, probably roughly six to eight weeks prior to the draft, you have all of your seniors in a pro day workout. And basically what it is, it's an Indianapolis uh, combine day, height, weight. They do a Wonderlick test. They test them in short shuttles, the 40-yard dash. They do individual drills. They have one-on-one individual meetings with position coaches, coordinators, sometimes head coaches show up, and some, and a lot of scouts and Sometimes even a general manager or director of player personnel, they'll show up and they just flood the field and they've got access to those players pretty much for almost about eight to 10 hours all day long. And then as a mob, you know, all 32 teams, they scatter and, you know, half of them go to another school and half go across the country. And, and they basically do that for about three months. Well, us not having one, I think it really hurt our football players. I think there was probably potentially two to three players that I think had we had a pro day and they could have worked out for people, maybe would have gotten drafted. But fortunately, uh, some of them got signed as free agent. And I still think that there's a couple of guys that has signed as free agents that if they'd have had a pro day, I think people would have been enticed and said, you know what, we want them to be a part of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, from a coaching perspective, like I flood all the, the NFL teams, all 32 teams, you know, we send out a bio about every one of our players, their stats, Uh, their GPA, their grades, you know, all the things that they've done for the football program, their character, integrity, their leadership, anything that's positive about those players. And and so subsequently, the four players that did sign as free agents, you know, it's basically two things. One, they earned the chance because of the way that they played. And then the Mm -hmm. second part of it is, is myself and a lot of the other assistant coaches, you know, helping contact, you know, position coaches in the NFL. And one of the things that helps us, and I, I'll be honest with you, you know, my background of having coached in the National Football League helps. Yeah. But Kevin O'Neill, our trainer, uh, was two-time trainer of the year in the National Football League. He knows a lot of people in the NFL. Kennard Lang, our defensive line coach, played in the NFL. Uh, Bryn Renner played a couple, a couple of years in the National Football League. Yeah. Uh, you know, so we've got several other guys. Uh, Jared Cruzy, who is our – co-defensive coordinator, coached at the Cleveland Browns and at the New Orleans Saints. So all the coaches that you have that have contacts, uh, you know, you can reach out to them. And, uh, you know, reaching out to people like Kenny Dorsey and Danny Morgan at, uh, at the Buffalo Bills, you know, and, and tell them, hey, give this kid a chance. He, he's not going to embarrass you. If you sign him as a free agent, bring him in. Uh, Chuck Pagano at the Chicago Bears, I think that Chuck did a great job in helping get uh, Napoleon Maxwell an opportunity to go to the Chicago Bears. Yeah. Now that Damian Lewis uh, has gone now and was with us for the last two years, he's gone to the Seattle Seahawks, so he's going to be the co-defensive line coach with Clint Hurt. And, uh, uh, you know, so having people in all these different franchises really helps you try to sell somebody to give these guys a chance. Uh, I think that, you know, most of the schools uh, – or most of the NFL teams, they try to have a mini camp right after the draft. I mean, within a week or two weeks after the draft, yeah. they try to sign 20 to 25 or 30 free agents and bring them in with their draft choices and have a three-day practice. Uh, they practice once on Friday, twice on Saturday, and some, some teams will practice twice on Sunday or at least once. Mm-hmm. And they may actually say, you know what? This free agent that we just signed for a three-day contract, he's maybe better than the seventh-round draft choice. And I've seen that happen where they've cut a seventh-rounder yeah. and, and, and kept somebody that they brought in. Most of the teams in the NFL, from what I understand, are hoping to try to have one of those three-day minicamp deals, but it's not going to happen here in the next two to three weeks. They're hoping yeah. to maybe have it maybe in the middle of June, maybe the end of June, uh, June prior to them going to training camp so that they get a chance to look at another 30, 35, or 40 uh, potential free agents. So, you know, you hope and you got your fingers crossed that these guys get a chance. Coach, one one facet I, I see 
one question I see asked a lot around draft time or when folks are watching the combine, um, you know, there might be a great, a great college player and then they maybe slip based on their times or performances at the combine or a pro day a little bit, or they might have a great, you know, might be vice versa, the one way or the other. What is that balance? You know, you'll see, I, you know, one talking point uh, I saw in this past draft, I think Jake Fromm from Georgia dropped a little bit. Obviously, he's a great collegiate player, so folks wonder, well, why, yep. why was he dropping based on, you know, just what something happened outside of a game? How, how important are those vitals that you get at, at a combine or at a pro day, and how do you weigh that against, you know, how good a guy may have been in college? Yeah, well, I think it's part of it, okay? Yeah. And I think the teams that put 100% into their draft based on the Indianapolis combine are probably the teams that are doing a lot of losing. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a team you go there and you hear it comically. People talk about that being uh, the underwear Olympics because <laughs> it's guys that are running fast, they're vertical jumping, and, and, and it helps you understand, you know, height, weight, speed, change of directions. Uh, they do individual drills so you can see them flip their hips and break and get out of uh, – you can see defensive linemen, you know, how fast can they explode off the line of scrimmage, how much can they turn their hips and fly – uh, in a pursuit angle, you see receivers and defense backs. How well do they catch the ball? Are they, you know, and, and almost every NFL team has a way in which they grade that. It may be a one to ten, it may be one to seven, and, yeah. and if they catch every single ball and everything in great hands, they may get a seven or they may get a ten. If they're inconsistent, they're probably going to get a five or a six or low grade, and they grade everything. Yeah. And uh, you know, the big thing, what really got it all started was was bringing people from a medical standpoint because uh, franchises were frustrated of drafting kids and bringing a kid in and finding out he's had multiple concussions or he's got low back issues or he's got, uh, he's torn, you know, his labrum in his shoulder. He's got yeah, ACLs yeah. that have been torn. So bringing them there, I mean, it is the, the biggest thing that comes out of there is how healthy is the kid, you Good know, point. that you're potentially going to give millions and millions of dollars to. So that's yeah. one aspect of it. The other aspect is is the one-on-one -on -one opportunity to interview people. Instead of flying all over the country, if you wanted to interview 300 people, I mean, you don't have enough time to do that. But if you've got 300 people all in Indianapolis and you've got your, your coaches and your coordinators and your uh, uh, personnel people and the head coach, the owners go to this a lot, the general managers, and you flood, you know, interviewing them in hotel rooms or interviewing them out in the hallways or in, in private interviews, and you get, a, you get a little bit of a sense of what kind of individual is this guy. And then they all go back, AJ. I mean, everybody goes back, and you go back after the combine's over with, and now the scouts who have been going to these campuses for a year, sometimes for two years, looking at these players, now the truth comes out. Now they try to say, well, we've interviewed the strength coach, we've interviewed the trainer, we've talked to the head coach, We've talked to the position coaches, and yeah. we've talked to the academic support people. We've talked to the campus police. We've gone to several different uh, bars or restaurants and things in the in the uh, area around the campuses to find out, you know, hey, is Joe Bob, is he in here four nights a week? Or is, I've never seen him. The kid never comes in here. And so, you know, so you throw all of those things together as you're trying to come up with great as to how you're going to rank those kids and so uh you know the combine's important but you know there's there's probably about 15 to 18 percent of the kids that make the final rosters that never even got invited to the combine they were free agents or yeah. uh, maybe they got drafted in the fifth sixth seventh round but they weren't invited to the combine so uh you know if, if football people are doing what they should be doing watch the film you know the yeah. film doesn't lie. It tells yeah. you how does the kid play? Is he passionate? Is he does he hustle every single player? Does he loaf every other the play? Is he busting coverages? I mean, there's a variety of things, and I think single, you know, the single most important thing is watching the video of how does a kid play. Read a, I think I read a long form article on ESPN during last year's combine. I think it was by Wright Thompson. Uh, he, he essentially said, look, the two story, like obviously you have your evaluation at the combine, but the two other big things about it, it's a great event for television. Yeah. All right. In the off season, get to get some ratings for the networks. And it's a great chance for all the coaches and execs to go to the local Indianapolis steakhouses and have the best steak <laughs> and catch up. No doubt. Yeah, <laughs> there's there's a lot of truth combine. in that. <laughs> There's a lot of truth. But I tell, to be honest yeah. with you, yeah. you know, because when I went with Jimmy Johnson to Dallas Cowboys, I mean, we were unbelievably fortunate. 
I mean, we went to all the all-star games. We went to the combine and uh, Jerry, you know, Jimmy got Jerry to give us his private plane. And I mean, we flew to all the pro days. I mean, I, yeah. I bet you, we probably went to, I don't know, 15 to 20 of them. And then we went to some of the pro days. We went as a, almost a whole staff to those. And then we broke up and, would go to campuses where they only had one player. Maybe they had two players, uh, you know, and so you, you you were on the road almost the entire time leading up to the draft. And yeah. uh, it's amazing what you can learn when you get a chance to spend some time with an individual kid that just sitting there and talking to them, sure. you know, how articulate is he? How much does he know? Uh, I'll give you a little story that when I was, at, when I was at the Cleveland Browns and uh, we went and uh, Bruce Arians and I, and I think Terry Rubisky went with me, and we went down and, and we worked out uh, Philip Rivers at North Carolina State. And uh, and I, I'll be honest with you, Philip Rivers might have been, of all the quarterbacks that I got a chance to go and put on a, on a chalkboard and, yeah. and interview him and stuff, he was brilliant. I mean, I, I don't know that I ever knew a kid. We handed him the chalk on a dry erase board and said, okay, go to the board and we want you to tell us about your offense. And about six hours later, he shut up. I mean, he <laughs> talked, he knew the protections, he knew coverages, he knew, he knew all the disguises of secondary. Uh, he knew everything that they had, how they audibled. I mean, you sit there and you're like going, Oh my God, you know, this yeah. guy and, and coming out of, out of college, you know, he was a first round pick and he went to San Diego and he had an unbelievable, brilliant career, but you just knew this guy's going to have great success, you yeah. know? And, uh, and so, you know, that's why I enjoy and I like, and I like with, with college high school recruiting, I like going and meeting kids and talking to them and, and getting a, a feel for them because you find out, you know, who's egotistical and who's it all about them or is it all about the team and I want to win. Sure. No, absolutely. Uh, you, you mentioned you referenced Dallas. It's a good segue. We're going to talk about us uh, for a few minutes, your time with America's team, a lot of sure. success there uh, in the Lone Star States in the, the early to mid nineties, uh, the, the Super Bowls. Well, let's start with the one in 90, 93 coach. I think people forget, you know, they see the final score, uh, 52 to 17 over Buffalo. Um, you know, the offense, you stand out, but do not forget the performance that your defense p- yeah. put on that day. Nine turnovers. That was right. a Super Bowl record. What is the feeling for a coach when, when everything in the biggest stage is going as good as it did that night? That, that has to be yeah. one of the more memorable, obviously, but the, the performance your defense yeah. put on and each turnover is taking yeah. that. Well, I got to be honest. I think that almost everybody, whether it's the players or the coaches or Kevin O'Neill, the trainer, and everybody that was there, uh, it was a dream come true. I mean, if you've been in coaching and if you played football and you go, oh, my God, I'm actually on the sidelines at the Super Bowl. And obviously, you know, I, that was Super Bowl 27. And so as a coach, you've probably watched all the first 26 of them. And, and uh, standing on the sidelines, I, I don't know how everybody else felt, but I can tell you how I felt when Michael Jackson walked in front of me to go out to the middle of the field to, be, to sing. I almost couldn't talk. I mean, it's like, you know, and then they had the air, the jets flew over the yeah. Pasadena, the Rose Bowl and out into the ocean. And it's like, oh my God, this is, you know, and then obviously uh, if you watch the game and if you ever see any of the NFL highlight films and stuff, I was terrified that we were going to get blown out of the game. I don't. I think the first two possessions they had, I think they had about 175 yards. Yeah. Fortunately, we created turnovers and they didn't get into the end zones, uh, but we couldn't get them stopped. Yeah. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, momentum started to change. The offense caught on fire. Uh, Troy and Emmett and Michael were doing a great job. Jay Novacek. And then defensively, uh, you know, Dave once said who was the coordinator did a phenomenal job. We, 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 had, it was the first time that we'd seen an up tempo type of an offense. And at the time, you know, it was the K gun with, with Jim Kelly. Yeah. And uh, so Jimmy allowed us to practice with not only the scout team offense, but the actual offensive team uh, so that we could have two sets of, 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 of an offensive one would go and then 10 seconds later the other would break the huddle because we had to get into the routine of how we're going to signal from the sidelines how we're going to communicate on the field and play and it took us it took us a possession or so to kind of get you know calm down to where everybody knew exactly what they were going to do and then obviously yeah. once we got into it um, then our defensive line and our secondary linebackers we just dominated the game I mean uh, Charles Haley was all over him I think we knocked Jim 
uh, Kelly out of the game. And Jimmy Jones, you know, caught a fumble in the middle of the air and, and took it in for a touchdown. And then everybody laughs about the Leon Lett, you know, the sack fumble. And he picks it up and runs yeah. the length of the field and gets stripped at the one-yard line. But, I mean, it was a – you know, it was an unbelievable defensive uh, performance that night. And, you know, I mean, you just – it's a dream come true to be able to say, you know, I was on a team that, that uh, you know, won a, won a Super Bowl. There were so many impressive wins that year to get to that point. I mean, you set the tone in the season opener when you beat the Redskins, who had just won the Super Bowl. Uh, you had to go to Candlestick in, in San Francisco to get to the Super Bowl. Yep. Um, some pretty impressive wins. All right, so that you're trying to defend that the next year. Um, yep. That doesn't doesn't go according to plan. The first couple of weeks to go zero and two to start the season. Um, yeah. Emmett Smith Emmett Smith wouldn't sign a contract. Jerry wouldn't come up with the money until we went zero and two, and then yeah. it's like, well, you know what? I think yeah, you what? probably do need Emmett Smith on this yeah. team. And got that him clarified back and things. Got on a roll. Yeah, tell me about ninety three. Did you feel like you were defending something? Was there any added pressure? <laughs> still have that that that. Pers- mindset of yeah. pursuits of something of another one just what was the mindset of the team it was different yeah aj i mean the first one was just a you know it, it was kind of like a dream like you're you're competing every week you're trying to win all of a sudden you get in a row you get in the playoffs you win the playoff games you win the super bowl and then the second one might have been i don't know it, it, i don't know how other people would have thought but in yeah. some respects to me it was almost hard uh, because you had to deal with the unbelievable high expectations, you're the defending Super Bowl champion, okay? Yeah. Can you do what the 49ers have done? You know, the 49ers, I think, have won, they won like four Super Bowls in like six years. And, you know, can you go back-to-back? Because at that time, very few franchises had ever gone back-to-back, you know, and then the Emmett holds out. And then we had some injuries during the course of the year. And, and uh, you know, Troy missed a couple of games and, and, uh, you know, Jimmy did a phenomenal job. He brought in Bernie Kozar, and Bernie came in and, and did a good job helping until Troy could get healthy and come back. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the culture within that football franchise at that time and, you know, the Cowboys, I think, you know, the next year we go to the NFC Championship game and probably should have won that game mm-hmm. and potentially yeah. could have won four Super Bowls in a row. But, you know, the culture was everybody believed that you were going to win. And the coaches did a phenomenal job of preparing the guys, and it didn't matter who got hurt. Didn't, yeah. The next guy stepped up and uh, filled in for whoever we had to set out for a couple of games. It, one of the things somebody told me, and I don't know if this is a 1,000% true, but in Super Bowl twenty seven, the, the starters that started the Super Bowl game were the same starters that started game one. Now, we had kids that missed games during the course of the season – but we didn't lose anybody for the entire yeah. season. I don't know that. Second, the second year, that clearly wasn't happening. You know, we, <laughs> no. we lost some guys that didn't play for the, the entire season. And mm-hmm. so that made it significantly. And, and, all, and the other part of it is, is, you know, everybody's targeted. This is the Super Bowl defending champions. You got everybody's best effort, their best performance, the best game plans that they can put together. And, uh, yeah. you know, but our – the players in that franchise, I mean, they love to compete and they love football and they love to win. Between Jimmy, uh, Dave, and yourself, what, was, was there anybody else from that Oklahoma State staff that was also really? on that Absolutely. Dallas staff? Tony Wise. Yeah. Yeah. To, in my opinion, Tony Wise, I mean, that's I awesome. you know, he might be one of the best offensive line coaches that have ever coached in collegiate or in the National Football League. I mean, his ability to prepare guys and to get guys uh, ready to play and, uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, I mean, you think about it. We went one in fifteen, and Mark Tuane and Nate Newton and a lot of those guys were the offensive line that went one in fifteen. And yeah. everybody would have said, "Well, you know what? You know, we got to get rid of these guys. We got to kick them to the curb. They can't play." Well, he kept, you know, Kevin Gogan and and those other two guys. Those three were the same guys that were playing in the very first Super Bowl. Yeah. And you added in Eric Williams and you added in Mark Stepnoski and. And, uh, you know, next thing you know, I mean, they were probably one of the best offensive lines to ever play. But, he, yeah, uh, Oklahoma State, you know, I think he – I think Tony, Dave, myself, uh, obviously Jimmy, that was probably the only group. But there was significantly more from the University of Miami staff because we took Joe Brodsky, who was the running back coach, and -hmm. and Hubbard Alexander, who was the uh, wide receiver coach. He had coached Michael Irvin. Uh, in college at, at Miami, and obviously yeah. he did a great job coaching Michael uh, in the National Football League. So, you know, it yeah. was pretty much kind of like a family affair. No, that's that's 
as good as it can be when you when the guy, guys you've coached with from years, years and years you, and you, then you go up a level and Mike, michael jackson singing the national anthem and you're all <laughs> thinking man yep, no <laughs> we've come yeah. a long way especially I mean, you told me on the podcast we'll probably talk about it again down the road but when you were a high school coach uh going down to texas to, to go over film with coaches and using bed sheets as a projector yep. by the time you got back to, to go over that film. All right. Uh, so one more question from Twitter here before we wrap things up. Uh, it's from Steve on Twitter. Uh, he's got one for both of us. He says, AJ Butch, what's the first place you're going post lockdown? That's a <laughs> hell of a question. Butch, I'll let you start uh, off. <laughs> where, where are we going well, with they, the full lockdowns? I don't lifting? know when they're going to stop the lockdown, but the first place I'd love to go is Joe Stonecraft. That's, yeah. You know, that would be the, if, you know, I'd like to go over there on the on South Beach and go yeah. in there. And, but they're going to they're going to quit doing the stone crabs probably sometime around the 1st of May. And yeah, uh, not, they may not, not be able time. to do it. You know? <laughs> uh, Steve, you, you probably could have anticipated this answer. I'm going to be going to Waffle House. OK, that's the first place I'm going to be. going. I think Waffle I already. Ha- Let me tell you something. Waffle, yeah. Waffle House is open. They, they yeah. just bring it out to the curb. You know? Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a little different. It's not the normal sense of Waffle House. I think the, yeah, the few that so you can good. go to sit inside everything, you know, it's lots roped off. You can't yeah. play the jukebox, but I look forward to the normal yeah. <laughs> Waffle House experience when uh, when things get back to normal. Coach, this has been fun as always. I'm sure we'll do it again yep. next week. Uh, have a good weekend. Any, any fun plans in store here? Well, they've opened up golf, okay? So <laughs> that is maybe... Huge. Yeah, the weather's decent and, uh, you know, may get a chance to go out and walk nine holes or something like that, get a yeah. little bit of exercise. And uh, I, I, I don't know if I'm going to have to carry a shotgun or that, that bear. They keep seeing the bear. He was in our yard two nights ago again. So, uh, you know, I got to worry about that, that, that dead gum bear. Yeah, be careful about the bear. Uh, I, I've got golfing in mind too, but by the time I reach the fifth or sixth hole and, and have a couple double bogeys on the scorecard, I might wish I was back watching Ozark at the house. So we'll see. <laughs> we'll, see we'll see how that goes. Uh, we'll talk go. to you next week. Ever, thanks to everyone for joining us on our uh, on our hangout once more. We'll do it again soon. Butch, have a good round. All right, we'll talk. Yeah, soon. thank you guys. Great to be with you. All right, pause up, everyone. See you soon.